Hello. This time we have the chance to meet with Graham Kang, a seasoned photographer in fashion and fine art photography. Although he shoots digitally most of the time, his love for film and analog is never too far away. In fact, his 10-8 camera is, well, slightly <laughs> impressive. <laughs> he welcomed us to have a chat and film in the Glass Factory studio. He designed and built the place himself throughout the lockdown. He formed a large infinity cove in the main studio area and dedicated a separate dark room fully kitted out, including a massive 10 by 8 enlarger. It's an impressive space. Everywhere you look, there are curious artifacts and interesting corners to explore, from the plans chest filled with prints to the complete collection of UK Vogue magazines. Possibly curated by design or maybe by accident, it sure makes for an eclectic mix and certainly adds to that old school vibes of the place. In this session, Graham shares insights into his early photographic experiences and gives us a taste of what it takes to create some of his most iconic collections, not to mention the hard lessons learned from those shoots. He also talks about who and what his main influences are and how it affects his work, particularly his fine art exhibition pieces and the striking editorial work that is continually being published today. Now here's Graham in his own words. So how did you begin your photography journey? Well, you know, I think my first camera was a Zenith E, um, which I got in 1974, bought from a woman next door on a, on a catalogue, £2.25 a week, and I, was, I thought I was the bee's knees. Um, at that time, I had a girlfriend, and uh, my best friend was obviously quite a good-looking guy, South African guy, and we went and shot an editorial up in Soho Square, or first attempt at editorial. No idea where we did it, we were just having fun, really, and a bit of posing. Not the best shots, but I've still got them. And obviously, you know, they represent a period in time. It was about me learning to understand the camera, how to, how to make it work, getting exposures right. And obviously for every, like everything else, for every good shot you get, there's 60 or 70 that are absolute pants and you're never gonna show anybody. But that's part of the learning process, particularly shooting with analog. And learning to have fun. Yeah, learning to have fun. During that time also, I started working with a local studio um, and we lived literally around the corner to where my mum is, and our mum was, sorry, and we um, were shooting weddings and things like that. So I'd go out on the weekend and we'd shoot weddings again all on film. And he lent me a twin lens reflex, a Rolleiflex, which was a beautiful camera that actually belonged to the, uh, f what would it be, 40s, 50s photographer, Baron, who was responsible for shooting the, one of the Queen's early portraits and was in fact going to be, was put in the, the shortlist for the Queen's coronation. But it actually went, in the end, they chose Cecil Beaton because he was more of a society photographer at the time. But it was nice to have that little bit of social history as well to have that camera working with that. Mm. So that was interesting. A um, few years on again, one of, one of the guys I was working with, so I'm still doing construction this time, one of the guys I was working with, his aunt was doing a shoot up in, in uh, Covent Garden um, a really good fashion photographer by the name of Jeannie Savage. Um, she's now working out the state. She's still shooting. Um, and uh, she, she was looking for a second assistant, basically, to help, out of all things, a Freeman's catalogue. And it was oh, 14 <laughs> pages on a Freeman's catalogue, but it was a two-week two shoot. So I went along and was basically in the background being the, the, the helper's helper, a second assistant on this shoot. I was, I was basically the runner. So as we were doing the test and the clips, I was running everything up to Joe's basement and getting it all back on the same day. And uh, it was just the most, it just changed my life. And um, it came to it and she said, have you, have you enjoyed it? And I said, well, it's changed my life. This, this is really, really what I want to do. So that was the real turning point, if you like, in my, in my journey. And she said, well, it happens that a friend of mine is um, just sacked his assistant. He's looking for another assistant, but there's one hang up. Um, she said, the problem is his last assistant was called Graham. Um, a guy called Graham Richardson, who's still a good friend of mine. She said, so he may be a bit funny. He's, he's a bit of a strange man. So I went to meet Robert Gothard, who was working for Preview Magazine. He owned and ran Preview Magazine with a guy, a guy called Chris, Chris uh, Astridge, who went on to form For Him Magazine. So he was, he was the publishing side and Robert was, a, was the uh, photography side. Uh, Robert was known for his men's fashion worldwide. He was a very, very high, highly sought after men's fashion photographer. So I went to see him and uh, it was a very strange interview to say the least. 
he, he was sat there in all full leather, leather jeans and leather jacket, big frizzy for, uh, hair, smoking his Sitan cigars. And he went, oh, okay. So, no, I can't, you can't work with me, your name's Graham. And so I said, well, Jeannie Savage has sent me over to see you because she thought I might be of, of value to you. So he, he went on the phone and rang her. Of course, the old corded phones in those days. He rang her and he came back. And he went, OK, I'll give you a chance. You've got a two-week chance. But I'm not going to call you Graham. I'm going to call you Ken. <laughs> so he, <laughs> I went, OK. So he took me on and I was then, as I stayed with him, I was known as Ken for the next two and a half years, which was all well and good, but it caused problems when we went to the airport to fly out because we flew all over the world quite a bit. Because you go, oh, Ken, Ken, Ken. Particularly at passport control when I went, but your name's Graham. So uh, weird, it was weird. It was a weird two and a half years, but I learned so much. Um, he chose all of his locations from the Guide de Michelin because he was a big foodie. So we went to some amazing, amazing places, five star everywhere. Um, and you know, I was getting no money whatsoever, but all the clothing we had, the clothing room was probably half the size of the studio. So probably about a thousand square foot clothing room. And it was all next season's clothing, obviously. And he just went, oh, go and get some clothes. So I was wearing next season's clothes all the time. And uh, we, I remember one, one little anecdote. We were doing a shoot one day and he went, oh, God, you look terrible. Go and get, go and get, go and get something out of, the sh out of the thing. And I went and got this jumper out, really, really nice red silk jumper. And he went, yeah, 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 you wear that. And uh, it was from a, a, an up-and-coming designer called Paul Smith. So <laughs> really, really bizarre, but it was... You know, that's what it was. Yeah. Some of the odd days where you go in one day and you go, oh, what, what are you doing tonight? And I'd think about it and nothing much. I went, oh, good. And he gave me a, an A4 envelope. He said, take those over to Paris. We need to deliver these, these images over to the Paris agency. Of course, in those days, no, no internet, no, none of those yeah. things. So it was all physical delivery. So he went, OK, there's a car arriving in half an hour. There's your ticket for the airport. Off you go. So I'd fly over to Paris, deliver these pictures at the agency, I'd be then out partying with the AHC guys all night, back at the agency in the morning, pick up some more pictures, back on the plane and back to London. I mean, it was a, it was a mad, mad world. You know, it was a crazy time. So two and a half years working with him. Graham, who do you think your influences are or where do you get your influences from? I think my influences have been kind of wide and varied, really. I mean, obviously I was born late 50s um, with my mum being a tailoress as well. There's always kind of kind of classic and vintage dress patterns around. So I'm very influenced by the 50s, the feel of the 50s. Um, and obviously, you know, I think from photography, I looked at that early on as that kind of feel and style. Um, within that, I suppose one of my biggest influences would be Avondon. Um, and with you and I have talked about this before, I think one of the most important images for me, the most thing that really sparked it for me was the image of Davima with elephants. Um, and I think it's a landmark image because it was the first time that photography was taken out of the studio environment and taken, in this instance, to a circus. Um, and um, I, as you know, I've got a signed print of that, which is probably one of my most treasured items, I guess. Um, so that was quite an in interesting thing for me. It was a very, very influential point. So for within that, I guess, obviously Dior, Balenciaga, earlier Balenciaga, not so much the streetwear now, obviously it's got its place, but for my influence is that kind of feel. Um, for whatever reason, I think I've got a fetish with hats. I love the, the glamour of hats and you know that, that kind of feel, so that's interesting. Um, moving on forward, obviously from my time when I was working at Preview Magazine, um, I was lucky enough to meet David Bailey, I don't, obviously one of my all-time heroes, but very much his work, his stark, kind of really appealing way of drawing out the character in people. I think that, that again, was quite an interesting thing for me, the way he drew their soul out. Yeah, yeah and I think that's something that I've tried to muster and bring into my photography, and hopefully I'm better at it now. But again, it's ever-evolving. It's about that thing, someone comes in nervous, you've got to settle them down, and there may be 50 people in a room, but you've got to make them think it's only you and them. So I think that's the important one thing I've taken from Bailey. Um, within that, I guess there was other people around Donovan, who was a great photographer who sadly killed himself at the, the, the you know, in his studio. That was to do with the death of analog and digital age that came in. Um, probably 
Bob Carlos Clark, who again I met, another tragedy, an amazing, amazing photographer. Um, I, I own quite a bit of his work and uh, very proud of it as well. Uh, again, I look at the inspiration. His work is slightly darker, a little bit more edgy. Um, Helmut Newton, um, who I adore Helmut Newton. Um, very different. He shot what he wanted rather than what they, what Evers wanted to see. And I think the interesting thing about Helmut Newton's work is when he started appearing in Vogue, the reason they put his work in, they knew it was controversial, but it was to, be, to make the, the editorial a bit more spiky. So that, that edition of the magazine would be more spiky and it would cause comment. And it goes back to the whole thing, there's no such thing as bad publicity. Because people were in uproar about it, it made it, it kind of drew everyone more back to Vogue. So again, I think all these things have their places. I suppose Tim Walker, very much so, his style. I, kind of, I feel of that is in my work now. Um, De Machelier, I love his work as well. Very, very strong work. Um, I think what I'm going to now in my current style of work, I'm going, my, even my digital work is more analog feel. So I'm, I'm going more to grain, soft focus, and that kind of style. And that relates back to Sarah Moon, um, who also pre-Bieber campaigns. In the same kind of time frame as her, there would be Serge Luton, who not a lot of people know about, but his work is stunning. Um, shooting from the 30s through to the 70s, 80s. He went from a photographer, he went on to be um, a director, art director. He went on to make, create his own perfumes, which is what he's known for now. Um, and he did a lot of Japanese campaigns. His work was very, very avant-garde. And again, very influential in the kind of feel of the work I'm trying to do now. Um, Current photographers, I guess, in that same field would have to be Paolo Reversi. I simply adore his work. Shoots a lot on 10 by 8, lots of Polaroid. His imagery will be photographed. If he photographs, I'm say, say I'm photographing you, I wouldn't point my 10 by 8 at you. It would be at the mirror. It would be a mirror reflecting you. Um, long focus, lots of techniques within the Polaroid work. It gave just simply stunning, divine work. And it's something I kind of feel I'm drawn to. Um, and probably the last one, which is someone, again, you and I have discussed, is an American photographer called Eric Madigan Heck. Mm -hmm. Now his work is multidisciplinary. His mum was a very big artist and his work is multifaceted. Um, but he, again, his work is painterly. Mm -hmm. It's a very painterly style. Um, lots of graphics, graphic edging what he does. And it's just, opens your eyes to new styles and new diversity, I guess. So I guess that's kind of where I'm going and that's helped me influence where I'm at. And I don't try and copy any of those, but I hope I can develop my own style to replicate those kind of feels, if you like. Make it your own. Make it my own, yeah. Um, I think, obviously, Jean-Paul Gaultier, brilliant. Recently went to see the Freak Show, which was, again, you know, all this whole kind of visual influence of things that are around you. Um, and I, I think they're really important. I think another thing that was really influential for, to me was um, the collaboration between Richard Avenden and Versace in the 80s. It produced ad campaigns at the time, which were just so out there. Again, Avenden had this ability to inject so much life and movement and energy into his photography. I mean, it's, it's well, well documented that he literally wore his models into the ground to get the imagery he wanted. He just shot them to death to get what he wanted. Um, and I just think that kind, of, that kind of intensity is where it's at. I know that when I'm, when I'm in the space and I'm shooting, it's, it is that intensity. It's, if, I, if I have a really long day shoot, um, finishes, it's like coming off set, I can't, can't calm down. The net, I'm just buzzing from that, that energy that's kind of in that shoot. And I think, I think it's like feeding off the energy of everyone around you. Um, I think other things that come into it is art in general. I mean, I recently went to see the Walter Sickett exhibition at the uh, Tate Britain, and it was stunning. And again, I came away from that with some ideas and concepts, scribbled little notes and bits and pieces down in my book. And it's like my book of dreams. You go back to these things, and these are things you are going to make or produce at some later time in, in your life, I think. And that's important. I also enjoy dance, and again, more avant-garde styles and that kind of feel. And I think, I think inspiration can be taken from anywhere. One of my recent shoots I did, which I called uh, We Madame, which was 
obviously about female empowerment, um, was taken from a magazine that was sh imagery that was shot in probably the late 80s in Australia of all places. And it's from a magazine called Not Only Black and White Magazine. And it was produced by two, a guy, a guy and a male and female who were English, who set themselves up in, the, in Australia and produced this high-end magazine. It was mainly with sports stars, so very athletical bodies and things of that nature. Um, and all the big photographers shot for them. It was like the magazine to shoot for. I suppose the equivalent of that over here in that period would have been Ritz newspaper by David Litchfield. Um, was, was our kind of version of this you no know, kind of high energy, almost punkish, rebellious type of work. Um, and the, the, the editorial I saw in there was of a woman in really high couture dress, sw swathed around with nude ballet dancers, male ballet dancers. And so I, my version of that was to incorporate something slightly different, modern dress, obviously, but using male models of now, but tattooed models because that's the more relative to today's kind of thing. And um, I was, it, it worked, it was worked, it got published. And um, yeah, I'm proud of it. But I think, I think there's no such thing as original art. I think we all take our influence from anywhere. And it's not about copying, it's about taking the feel from what's around you, everything. So it's important to keep your eyes open, be open to new things. And uh, you never know what's gonna influence your next piece of work. We love some of your editorial work, so um, what's, what comes to mind for you, some of the more memorable? Well, I, th I think pre-lockdown, we try I tried to take a team away at least once a year and shoot editorials. Um, on each of these trips, we would um, shoot maybe three or four editorials. Um, obviously, within that trip time, we'd, we'd incorporate some free time to you know, kind of chill. Um, I got to work some really amazing collaborations and creative teams, which is nice. Um, I think one that comes to mind is um, the trip to Wales. Um, we went to, where did we go? I'm trying to think where we went to now. But we hired, basically we hired a, a cottage in Wales and we uh, travelled to do these three editorials. We had pretty bad weather, which is always the way. Um, back, in, back at that time, I used to take my pro photos with me on tour. So we had these like, big backpacks, which is basically generator packs so I could plug them in because obviously there were 240 volts so that we could actually shoot outside, which is um, quite crazy, really, when I think about it. Um, so we took all this kit down to Wales. I had to have two assistants because we had so much stuff. On this particular shoot, um, we went to Hendrick Falls, which is absolutely stunning. But the car park's about a quarter of a mile away from where the falls are. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think we planned it quite right. So we, we arrived there and we had all this kit to take down, all the, all the stuff we were going to do. Um, the concept of the shoot was, um, I called, my concept was Death of Beauty. So my concept was about a, a, a nymph dying and kind of laying in the water and all of the, the kind of the skin coming off, kind of appealing away as she was dying in the water. So we had to get all the kit down there. It was particularly cold, crisp kind of a day. Um, the lighting was terrible when we got there. But um, what I did, um, I used my photos again to overpower the daylight that was there. And in doing that, allowed me to really slow down the waterfall and make it almost like a, a curtainish type feel, which really added to the atmosphere of what's going on. Um, something I like to incorporate into my into my editorial work is more more of a kind of a landscape feel. I like to incorporate other elements of what's going on. You know, going back again to what we talk about as influences in our life. I love love foreign movies. My favourite director of all time is Kurosawa. With Kurosawa you'll have an opening scene, you'll hear a sound and then it'll pan round to that sound and the sound becomes the influence of what you're visual. So with me I like to incorporate things around it and make it a bigger picture rather than just the image if you like, the tightened in an image. So within this shoot, we kind of got all the kit down there and it was, it was difficult to say these several trips back for the assistance to get everything down there. And then we got this beautiful crisp mountain water that was coming down. There was the waterfall, there was then the stream coming in. We did, at that position, we did two editorials. One was a, a, a woman in a black floaty dress in the water laying on rocks and it was, Freezing, freezing cold. I mean, yeah, the water, I think the water was about three degrees, four degrees. Um, so it was hard. 
and then we put the main model in, um, in the, for the second editorial, which is the, the nymph vet shoot. It was freezing. We were all in the water trying to help and make it work. I don't ask anyone to do what I won't do. I was only in it up to my knees, um, but you know she was laying in the water, laying in the pool, and it was properly freezing. She was naked, this big over the top wig on, um, flowing wig, and she was covered in body paint and glitter. Now, I'm not gonna claim this was my concept for the shoot. It was put together by a very talented um, creative director um, and stylist for the shoot. We had, again, we had a good team on this thing. So it wasn't my concept. I was in cooperation with these people making this happen. Um, but it was amazing, it was amazing. The, the thing about this shoot was, uh, we kind of, we shot it and it was hard because trying to keep it natural when it was just so cold, it just, just sharpened the senses really, really hard. It made it, made it work. Um, following that, we did some more shots on the on the the bank side, and it was just amazing. But freezing, freezing cold. Now we came out and we we're walking back up this long, long hill. We're going back up to the up to the car park. We're trying to keep the model warm. She's shaking and freezing cold. Um, the two people had asthma attacks on the way back up. So one one was the creative director. Now we're all trying to lug all this kit up there because by this time now it's getting dark. And the darkness is coming in quick. Um, and the creative director kind of almost collapsed and we had to stop. Someone had to rush back up and get his inhaler. He didn't have it with him. The model that had been in the water was also suffering. You know, again, having asthma attacks. It was, it was a real traumatic thing. But we, got, we finally got back to the, the dig, we drove back, got back to the van, drove back to where we were. And um, we had a big hearty meal. Lots of alcohol, I have to say. And uh, we talked about it and just kind of reviewed the work we had. And I knew we had something good. I could tell we had something good. But it wasn't until we started looking at it maybe two days later um, that I realized just how good it was. Um, it was probably six months after the shoot before I put it out. And, and it was put out, uh, the, the model herself, um, had some connections, she knew where she wanted to go, and it ended up going to a French magazine called Oeuvre magazine, which was a fine art magazine. Um, probably features amongst some of my better work. Um, yeah, and I, and I guess it's interesting to see because you present 10 or 14 images and they make their choices based on what they want to present. Um, did they take the best images? They probably took the best images from their perception, but it's hard. it's hard to be kind of Focus on what you think is your best work. Because I think if you shoot something, you think, oh, I love this. And then you kind of move on because you always want to better. You always want to do something more. That's hard to be subjective about your own work, I guess. But yeah, I'm, I'm proud of it. We hope you enjoyed hearing some of Graham's stories in this session and glean some nuggets of photographic know-how. Do let us know your thoughts and comments. We'd love to know what you think and how we can improve the channel. I guess it's a reminder that we should all read and research and uh, remember some of those brilliant photographers and artists of the past 50 or 60 years. Um, it, it helps to rejuvenate our own spark, doesn't it? Uh, so we had so much work from Graham. Um, I'm not saying that he went on a little bit, but um, he went on a little bit. So we've got absolutely loads, <laughs> which um, we're going to kind of cut up and we're going to put in um, with some other photographers' questions. So, um, yeah, hopefully in the next uh, in a kind of couple of episodes, you'll see him back. So there are lots more photographers waiting in the wings who'd like to share their insights and experiences who we've already talked to, but uh, please hit the subscribe button and give us a thumbs up if you like watching this episode as much as we like making it. And we'll see you next yeah, time. Yeah, see you next time.